All right, this lecture focuses on the laws that affect pharmacy managers. Today's objectives will talk about HIPAA or, or uh, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, we'll also talk about um, permitted incidental uh, versus non-routine disclosures under the HIPAA privacy rule. We we'll want to be able to re uh, cite requirements of the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act or OBRA 90 as well as uh, the Pre Prescription Drug Marketing Act as well as the Hate Act. And then lastly we'll uh, touch on 340B and the 340B drug discount program. So let's get started with HIPAA. Originally uh, referred to as the Kassenbaum Kennedy Act for uh, Senators Nancy Kassenbaum and uh, Democrat Ted Kennedy. Uh, it was passed in 1996 uh, to a re Republican Congress and, and, and signed by a Democratic uh, president. I always throw this out here and I like talking about the history of some of these laws. Um, not for any particular purpose, uh, uh, for or not for uh, to side, you know, Republicans or Democrats, but just to show uh, how um, how laws are passed and uh, and, and it, you know we always see on the news these just these uh, this gridlocked Congress at times, and and just wanted to show that some of our biggest legislation. Um, the biggest legislation that, that we that we deal with on a regular basis um, has Republican and Democrat ties to it and, and typically that's how a two-party system works. So the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act uh, which became known as HIPAA uh, had a lot of big you know a lot of players involved. So its main objectives were actually to make healthcare delivery more efficient as well as to increase the number of Americans with health insurance. So think about that. With everything that you've learned about, um, you know, the so-called Obamacare or the uh, the um, the affordable uh, Affordable Care Act, um, you know, we've been talking about increasing the number of Americans with health insurance for uh, 30 years, 20, 30 years. It's not like um, just in this last presidency we've we've. Uh, uh, been talking about increasing people with health insurance. So uh, this was a major objective of HIPAA back in 1996. But what's interesting is that from a pharmacy management perspective, one of the biggest things, you know, some of the biggest things that came from it had nothing to do with its main provisions. So the main provisions were health insurance portability, tax provisions that were within the law, as well as uh, an administrative simplification. So it was a mandate. Uh, a mandate within the act was uh, for comprehensive health privacy legislation by August 1999. What's kind of funny is that you know the Congress basically said uh, we're mandating ourselves to pass privacy legislation. Within the mandate, then it laid out what happens if we don't pass privacy legislation. Well, guess what? Congress failed to pass legislation by 1999, so in the three years they couldn't put together health privacy legislation. And the uh, so the Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, was then charged with creating health privacy regulation. And in, and uh, you know, we'll, while this isn't a policy class, it's just important to note that uh, the difference between legislation and regulation. So anyway, the DHHS is under the executive branch, uh, and so that's why they would be involved with regulation as opposed to legislation. But in this uh, regulation, they created the standards for privacy of individually identifiable health information and was finally adopted in August of 2002. So based on HIPAA of 1996, uh, it took six years, but we finally got um, health privacy regulation. And some key terms that, that came out of you know, this regulation uh, number one is protected health information, or PHI. This is something you've, if you've worked in a pharmacy or in a hospital, you've probably become very familiar with, or have just been to any doctor's office in the last 10 years, and um, you know they make you sign these extra forms. A covered entity. Uh, we'll talk about covered entity and that definition uh, in in multiple or in different um, in different pieces of legislation, but it's a common term used. The uh, privacy notice and then disclosure. So we'll talk about disclosure. So for PHI, this is health information that's in any form, in any form and it's considered PHI if it one is created or received by a covered entity, it relates to an individual's past, present, or future physical or mental health condition, which also includes payment, 
and if it identifies the individual or creates a reasonable basis to believe that the information can be used to identify an individual. Now a covered entity under HIPAA is defined as any person or organization that provides care or possesses health records. Pretty broad, right? Um, and, and intentionally so. And also uh, specifies health plans, so insurance companies, as well as clearing houses, and these are referring to the companies that process health insurance claims. Then we have the privacy notice. So this is supposed to be developed and distributed by the covered entity to explain uh, how the entity may use and disclose PHI. Uh, it's supposed to explain the individual's rights, basically what to happen if there's a complaint that needs to be filed, and who to contact further uh, in designating like a privacy officer. And provides and it must be provided directly to the patient. So ima imagine anytime you've been in a pharmacy or a, um, a doctor's office as a patient, um, you've probably gotten a form that has a bunch of small words and it's their pri it's the privacy notice. So next time you're in a uh, covered entity, you're in a in a health organization sometime, take a look at their privacy notice and just glance at all the uh, included items. All right, so let's talk about the disclosure. So we have different kinds of disclosures. A permitted disclosure, which a permitted disclosure includes um, these 12 different purposes where covered entities are allowed to disclose PHI. So essentially uh, public health activities, if, a, if they're suspected, if a patient's suspected of abuse, neglect, or domestic violence. Um, you know, the main one I think the pharmacy is going to run into quite a bit is law enforcement purposes. So think about that. If um, and, and this has happened in, in the past for me, um, where uh, a prescription is suspected of being forged, um, then and you know the police are involved. When the police show up at the pharmacy, um, you know it's important to, to know to know that that you're not bound by HIPAA not to be able to give information if if the uh, patients, you know, under um, investigation, and, and the police have proper paperwork, or at least. And again, I'm, you know, you're not a lawyer, so don't. Um, yeah, you know, I'm not going to give you the advice to uh, uh, how to handle it when the when the police come uh, come in. I would just err to the side of supporting any law enforcement um, and and uh, trust that that you know that they're following everything that they should be following. You know, don't. I don't know if I would put up too much of a fight. Uh, maybe you want to make sure you contact your, uh, if you work for a major chain, contact your hip, uh, privacy officer and, and maybe your district manager to find out, you know, what the exact process is to follow uh, when you do disclose PHI to law enforcement. Then there are incidental disclosures. So this is the common one that we come into where, uh, you know, there may be an issue um, you know that may come up and, and you may get you in trouble so an incidental disclosure may be like a patient in a semi-private pharmacy waiting area and they overhear a pharmacist counseling a patient um, and this is where there may be uh, uh, argument over well is it incidental or was it uh, you know was it a disclosure that that could get the pharmacy in trouble and then last but not least non-routine disclosures and this pretty much uh, includes any other type of disclosure to anyone without a direct treatment relationship. So if we switch gears over to high tech, um, which essentially provides updates to HIPAA, so this is the Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act. It was a part of the uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. It kind of updated some rules for HIPAA, like um, establishing a tiered penalty scheme for HIPAA violations. Uh, explains the covered entity is responsible for a HIPAA violation even if it claims uh, the violation was unknown unless it's corrected within 30 days of discovery. Um, it also provides uh, the state attorneys general with some authority. Uh, some just some other uh, updates that, that you can take a look at. Alright, so let's switch over to OBRA 90. This is one of my uh, favorite ones to discuss. And again, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1990. So I always love looking at all these OBRA laws because basically since the early 1980s, Congress and the President have been able to 
Um, you know, Congress has been able to, un to pass a full budget uh, for the United States, and so um, they're constantly doing these reconciliation bills um, rather than actually passing a real budget. So, you know, thanks to our politics, we also get these OBRA bills um, pretty frequently. And when you go back and look at health care law, it's fascinating how many major health care changes have happened as, a, as part of OBRA legislation. But anyway, OBRA 90 was the one that if uh, if anyone, and again, you guys were all born, I guess, after 1990s, you probably don't even remember this guy. This is the first President Bush, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. And in 1988, when he was running for president, he made this famous statement of, read my lips, no new taxes, was sort of his campaign promise. And... Um, Unlike, I guess, the politicians uh, that, that we're used to in the last decade or so, um, you know, politicians were able to, or well, they did flip-flop on issues and, um, you know, based on the needs of the, of the country. And this president um, signed this OBRA bill into law two years after he became president, which didn't actually um, create new taxes, but it did increase multiple taxes, and uh, his uh, opponent in 1992, uh, soon to be President Bill Clinton, so Governor Clinton in 1992, hammered um, George Bush on this uh, campaign promise of no new taxes when he ended up increasing taxes, you know. Uh, so anyway, I find it interesting that OBRA 90 was one of the, you know, kind of arguably one of the bills that uh, got the first President Bush into trouble, and um, regardless of your politics, I mean, I kind of, um, you know, like I find it was reasonable uh, of him passing, you know, or signing this this law. But anyway, so you know, a Democratic Congress and Senate, or a Republican president, so both parties were involved, if if anything. And uh, again, it didn't really uh, create new taxes, but it increased some taxes and. It impacted Medicaid, so this is kind of where um, where it affects us. So we think about its impact on pharmacy. It required each state to design and implement drug utilization review, or DUR. So you guys have probably seen this in your pharmacy. Whenever the pharmacist is verifying prescriptions, these little DURs will pop up. Over ninety not on, or only applied to pharmacists who service Medicaid patients. But what really happened um, while, you know, again, while that was the case, that, that it really only applied to Medicaid patients, uh, most states essentially extended the requirement to all patients. So here's where we get the make the offer to counsel requirement. So OBRA 90 uh, requires that all pharmacy, pharmacists or the essentially uh, all pharmacies make an offer to counsel patients. And if the patient refuses counseling, they must document um, document that there, you know, that that there was a refusal, and then add this, you know, and it also added some patient record requirements. But, um, you know, if you're ever asked, and this is something that if you're ever asked on a on a MPJE or or what have you, the um, you know pharmacists aren't required to counsel anyone. You know, a patient can refuse counseling, but uh, it is our requirement to at least offer to counsel. So that's a big takeaway from over ninety. Now, the Prescri uh, Prescription Drug Marketing Act of 1987, uh, it was signed into law in 1988. Again, a Democratic Congress and Senate and a Republican president, uh, President Ronald Reagan. It was an amendment to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. So, um, uh, you know, ma major uh, legislation from earlier in the century. It was in response to counterfeit drug, re uh, counterfeit drug reports. Um, it enacted. It was enacted essentially to ensure safety and effectiveness. So remember, safety and efficacy was a requirement from previous legislation. So if I were to ask you guys a little bit of trivia, you know, what could anyone name? You know, the 1938 or 1962 acts that established safety and efficacy standards in, for drugs in the United States. Now, if this was a live lecture, I would probably sit here quietly until someone raised a hand and, and offered a guess. But essentially, in 1938, we had the uh, we had President Franklin Roosevelt sign the FD uh, FD&C, so the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and this is 
was the improvement on the Food and Drug Act of 1906, but in 1938 we basically added the safety requirements, and then in 1962 uh, John F. Kennedy signed the uh, Kefauver Harris Amendment to the FDNC to require drugs to be proven effective in addition to safe. Um, the 1962 legislation was in response to uh, what had happened in, uh, around thalidomide, and and so uh, it's fascinating, you know, how long it takes our country to advance um, advance what we do and what we do now in the you know year 2016 um, so much has um, has evolved just over the last um, you know 80 years um, but it does take a while to get major pieces of legislation passed and sometimes it's in response to something terrible happening so if you can imagine if we're having counterfeit drug reports uh, in the in the mid to late 80s um, you know Congress may respond and act to do something that's kind of what they did. In this, they uh, wanted to prohibit drug re reimportation. So if a drug's made in the United States and it's shipped out to Canada or to Mexico or wherever, it can't be reimported. So sort of banned that. And then also prohibited the sale of drug samples. It also banned any resale of drugs by hospitals. And it restricts distribution of drugs to only licensed wholesalers and suppliers. So, if you can imagine, this this legislation is all about controlling the supply chain, making sure that our supply of drugs are in fact uh, what they say they are when they were when they leave the manufacturer's um, distribution center. So, uh, you know. It seems like something that both Republicans and Democrats can get behind, right? Now, it's interesting when you see stuff about drug samples and whatnot. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure the pharmaceutical manufacturers had a lot to say about about it during, you know, during the uh, um, while these while this law was in committee and going through Congress. But again, I was only three years old when this was passed, so I, I can't remember too clearly what was happening back then. Now the Hate Act is, a, you know, in response to uh, an, a tragedy. Uh, Ryan Haight was an 18-year-old who died from an overdose of hydrocodone in 2001, and so, um, uh, you know, I, I believe Ryan was able to get these uh, drugs online. And so, guess what? We amended our Controlled Substances Act, uh, where they may not be delivered or dis distributed or dispensed without a valid prescription and it required at least one in-person medical evaluation of the patient. But there was wording to allow some legitimate telemedicine. So again, the Hate Act was in response to something bad, so we had a tragedy, kind of like a lot of our bills that get passed. Um, and, and it was to try to tr you know, crack down on you know, these online pill mills or these online pharmacy operations. All right, I did want to spend a little bit of time on 340B. Uh, this is something I haven't uh, introduced into, into the pharmacy management uh, lectures in the past. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, it's being covered a whole lot in other areas, but I wanted to at least touch on it a little bit since this is an uh, area of the law that does affect pharmacy management and seems to be affecting pharmacy management much more now. So uh, 340B refers to a portion of the Veterans ha uh, Health Care Act of 1992. All right, so remember who was uh, our president that would have signed this in 1992? So that was also uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush. Um, so anyway, it was uh, um, it was basically in response to uh, drug price negotiations from pharmaceutical manufacturers. Uh, in 1990, part of that over 90 stuff that affected Medicaid, that allowed Medicaid to get basically the best price on any drugs. And so they're like, hey, if, and, you know, we also have the veterans health care um, that, that supplies the drugs for all of our veterans. Why don't, you know, if we get the discounts for Medicaid, why don't we try to get them uh, as well for the VA? And that's kind of the logic behind that a little bit. And, and it created this drug drug uh, discount program that surprisingly had, was pretty quiet for, gosh, 1992, um, 20, uh, 25, 28, 28 years, I guess. 2010 is when stuff started getting crazy with 340B, uh, and we won't get into a whole lot of that today, but, um, but essentially, 
um, it provides these big discounts on on drugs that really have an impact on brand name drugs. Um, so to be eligible, these have to be outpatient prescriptions, uh, and the discounts go to a covered entity. Uh, a covered entity we talked about with HIPAA is this is going to be a different definition than what we talked about with HIPAA. HIPAA defined it as you know any basically any healthcare organization or practitioner, whereas in the Veterans Health Care Act, a covered entity is very specific to certain types of organizations. And I got another slide that I'll give you an example of who are covered entities. And then a covered entity essentially gets the discount. And if they don't have a pharmacy, so if they have a pharmacy, they can, uh, you know, get the discount to their pharmacy. And if they don't have a pharmacy, they can contract out to a pharmacy. Uh, and this whole issue around the contract pharmacies, um, over the last six years, contract pharmacies uh, were basically, or covered entities were allowed to use more than one contract pharmacy in 2010. And that's what's really blown up the... Um, the use of contract pharmacies and why many of you if you go out and work at a Walgreens or CVS Caremark you may actually be a contract pharmacy to, to dispense 340B prescriptions. But anyway uh, here's the table I wanted to show you so I kind of developed this from the uh, uh, HRSA the HRSA website um, and there's the link to the HRSA website down below at hrsa.gov slash OPA so feel free to go check out that website. It's got everything you need to really learn if you want to know more about 340B in detail. So to become a covered entity, um, you need to either be a hospital that fits in one of these uh, categories, so a disproportionate share hospital or a dish. Um, they're typically calculated as, as if, you, um, if the hospital services over 11.75% of patients that go to the hospital are low income essentially. Um, also children's hospitals, critical access hospitals, rural health centers, uh, you can see the list here. Um, there's also F FQHCs, um, the uh, uh, sexually transmitted disease clinics, tuberculosis clinics, hemophilia treatment centers. So some very specific things, but most hospitals qualify under this disproportionate share hospital um, calculation. So imagine um, an example here at the University of Maryland Medical Center um, services enough patients that, that they would qualify as a disproportionate share. And so they are a covered entity. Um, that's really all I wanted to cover on 340B. I wanted you to kind of see what it was about, um, understand who the covered entities are, understand um, that, that it's outpatient prescriptions only. Um, if you if you want to learn more about 340B, please visit the HRSA website, uh, and then you can also send me questions as well. If you you know, but before any exams in our class, will uh, this this won't be a major a major thing. Um, last but not least, I just wanted to touch on state pharmacy practice laws. Um, every state governs the practice of pharmacy, or I should say each state. So uh, boards of pharmacy or, or an entity similar to that has the authority to grant licenses to pharmacy professionals. So you can practice in that state. And there's then a National Association of Boards of Pharmacies, or NABP, and this is essentially the professional organization that supports boards of pharmacies. Uh, to try to help implement uniform standards that way you know Texas and Florida and Kentucky aren't just practicing like completely different you know um, like a pharmacist in one state dispenses drugs and a pharmacist in another state um, I, I don't know where to go like does all kinds of crazy stuff so um, essentially they've developed a model state pharmacy practice act and if you were to pull that up and then kind of go down the line you'd probably see a lot of states are close to the model state pharmacy practice act all right so let's kind of wrap things up for today's lecture as a pharmacy manager you need to ask yourself a couple of things one does your pharmacy meet all the standards and requirements that uh, are set by existing practice laws. So what uh, this is kind of like asking yourself, um, you know, doing like a compliance audit. You know, is your pharmacy good to go if a board of pharmacy inspector were to show up today? And given that, who are my board of pharmacy contacts? 
you know, every pharmacy I've ever managed, I've the, one of the first things I've tried to know is based on the location of my pharmacy, I want to know who are my board inspectors. Are there certain board inspectors that are in charge of investigating the pharmacies in my specific area? I mean, it's good to know all the board inspectors at, at the state level because um, there's usually only, you know, the board has a staff of 5 to 10, 12 people. Um, so it's not like you have to memorize a bunch of people, but it would be really good to go to pharmacy board of pharmacy meetings, uh, network with the board inspectors, just get to know them. Um, every board inspector I've known has always just been extremely helpful. And again, they're not they're not you know meant to be your friend. They're meant to protect the consumer. Um, so just understanding that relationship, that being said, they're so helpful typically, and a lot of them are former pharmacists or have worked in pharmacies and, or have some pharmacy experience. And so they, they want to help you. So it's great to ask questions. Um, you know, be careful, I guess, in, in the sense of if you think you're doing something wrong, that may not, I mean, you, I don't know if you want to ask the question, like when you think you're doing something wrong, cause you know, they don't want to raise a red flag, I guess, but, um, but that being said, I mean, if you know, if you just have general questions, just to like confirm with them, hey, I, you know, I just want to make sure I'm clear on the way that I should do this. They, they're typically good to know. Now, who is my corporate compliance contact? So this is for anyone who goes into a big organization. So if you go work for a, you know, an independent pharmacy, it's probably going to be, um, you know, if you are an owner, uh, you're probably going to want a lawyer or, or some type of legal help, um, someone that you can, you know, work with to help you make sure you're in compliance. But for most companies, you know, they have these in-house lawyers and these compliance teams, and they're meant to be your resource. So you know, you're the pharmacy manager, you focus your efforts on running the best pharmacy you can and let your corporate compliance team give you recommendations on how to proceed. So um, definitely get to know what the process is of uh, for questions. A lot of times it may be through your district manager, um, you know, so it, it's just good to know within your company what the processes are to get questions answered. All right, so some tips to just try to get it stay in compliance I would definitely recommend having some type of checklist your company if you're with a bit with a big company probably already has a checklist in the form of a of a routine audit that you're you know when I was a district manager I was tasked with um, doing routine audits on my stores uh, and our company had uh, had the forms that they wanted us to fill out to to show that we were in and you know if you got through one of those corporate compliance audits you are likely to be in compliance with any state or federal laws you know with that you're going to re, re tune, or routinely review your uh, pharmacy practices and perform self audits uh, and do mock board inspections so I loved having this type of exercise with appy students so if uh, if you're precepting students when you get out which I, I encourage you to do after you've been out in practice for a bit um, take fourth year students and and uh, have them be your board inspectors uh, so they can be kind of a third party uh, and it's good practice for the students and uh, good for your pharmacy so again network with your state board inspectors follow any company policies uh, a lot of times your company policies are more stringent than the state laws uh, regardless of what the laws and regulations are, you should strive for best practice. And and so sometimes you may do something that's more stringent than what's required. But if it's a if it's a good practice to be into, just because it's good for quality and good for your patients, then I definitely assume, or I would definitely uh, recommend you do so. And then last but not least, please find a mentor if you don't already have one. Um, I I've, I've had five or six pharmacy managers when I graduated that were like on speed dial for me so I had plenty of pharmacists that had been out for several years that I would be uh, ready to call if I just needed a needed a, uh, a tip so let's run through a little case and see if we can answer a few questions John Doe is a new patient at a community pharmacy in Baltimore and fills a prescription for a tripla this is the first time John has been on this particular antiretroviral. When John picks up his prescription, the pharmacy technician hands him several pamphlets and asks if John has any questions for the pharmacist. 
John does have questions, and when the pharmacist comes over and starts talking, a patient in the waiting area overheard, this is used to treat HIV from the pharmacist. Frightened that John's HIV might be airborne, the other patient screams and runs out of the pharmacy. Is this considered a disclosure of PHI according to HIPAA? The correct answer is yes. Information relating to John's treatment and condition was overheard. Now, if this is a disclosure, so which we said it is, which type of disclosure is it categorized as? A. Not a disclosure. B. Permitted. C. Incidental. D. Non-routine. Or E. None of the above. So this would be categorized as an incidental disclosure. It's not necessarily considered a violation as long as there have been reasonable attempts uh, to prevent the rout uh, a routine disclosure of PHI. So again, if you were to counsel a patient and another patient hears it in the waiting room, uh, it could result in a complaint and it could potentially be a violation, but it's not necessarily a violation if it's de deemed an incidental disclosure. As a new patient to the pharmacy, the technician had several pamphlets to hand John Doe. To comply with HIPAA, what should one of those pamphlets have been? A triplet coupon from the manufacturer? B. A notice of the pharmacy privacy practices? C. Information about obtaining drug samples? D. Counseling information about a tripla? Or E. All of the above? The correct answer is B. A notice of pharmacies of the pharmacy's privacy practices would uh, help the pharmacy be in compliance with HIPAA. The technician asked John if he had any questions for the pharmacist. What law requires that pharmacy staff make the offer to counsel? A. HIPAA. B. High Tech. C. OBRA 90. D. PD, PMDA. Or E. The Hate Act. correct answer is C, OBRA 90. What can the pharmacist do in the future to prevent a situation like this from occurring in the pharmacy? A, utilize a private counseling room. B, suggest that the patient go home and call the pharmacy and perform the counseling over the phone. C, encourage the patient to post the question anonymously to the pharmacy's Facebook page. D, answers A and B, or E, all of the above. The correct answer is D, A and B. A, a private counseling area or having the patient call are both good strategies to protect uh, PHI. All right, that ends today's lecture. If you have any questions, be sure to uh, shoot me an email.